All right, so Tower of Babel, probably one of the more interesting stories that we read about in the book of Genesis. Uh, and there's a lot that we can learn from it, and, and we want to just point out a couple of things this morning for us to think about uh, that, that are, are uh, points where we can make uh, application for us, at, at least I think based on the uh, mistakes that the Amalekites made, or not the Amalekites, but those that the Tower of Babel made. Uh, and so we, uh, let me get the live stream started. Right, and so one of, the, one of the things that we know as a general principle, and, the, and that's the first thing on the PowerPoint, right, is that we often learn a lot in life when we either fail ourselves or whether, when, whenever we have to watch somebody fail. Uh, I know I, I watch a lot of uh, baseball, uh, and, and that's specifically true in baseball. Uh, whenever a player goes through a slump, he's not hitting the ball very well, I know a lot of times a player will go and watch himself on film and try to figure out, you know, am I doing something wrong in how I'm swinging or, uh, you know, if I'm coming to the plate, uh, have I done a good job scouting the pitcher about what type of pitch he likes to throw in, in certain situations and maybe I haven't done a very good job at that and so I go back and I reassess myself and, and look at how I failed and try to, to look better and, and, and to try to learn from failures. And, and that's really, when you think about the Tower of Babel, that's what we are, are really doing this morning. Uh, the Tower of Babel is a moment in the Bible where we see individuals fail. And we might could say that they fail very dramatically. And what we want to learn from their failures this morning are basically three different things. Uh, and, and first of all, we'll talk about how one of the things that we learn from the Tower of Babel is that what God has given us is always sufficient. God's provisions are always sufficient. And that'll be verses 1 and 2. Uh, that's how we'll break that down. Secondly, we'll talk about how ambition, right? Human ambition can often produce discontentment. Can often produce discontentment. And then we'll talk about how ambition can often create unhappiness as well, at least human ambition as well. One thing that I will say about the outline, if you see on number 3, uh, point number B, one took advantage of the kings and then it's got a blank out beside it. You can go ahead and cross that out. Uh, that was a mistake on my part. Uh, but those are the three things that we want to examine this morning looking at this story from the Tower of Babel. Uh, and, and first of all, one thing that we want to point out is that when it comes to God's provisions are sufficient, we want to think about what God had given to Noah after the flood. Because what we see in the, the story of the Tower of, the ba the Tower of Babel is that these individuals took advantage of what God gave to Noah because of his obedience. And for that we look at Genesis chapter 8 verses 20 through 22. We know that in the book of Genesis with the flood, right, God saw the wickedness of man, saw that it was great. God uh, made the decision, right, I have to remove the wickedness from the world, right? And, and, and he was going to do that through a flood, but we know, of course, that it was Noah that found grace in God's eyes. And as a result, God spared Noah, his sons, his wife, uh, and his sons, wives, his family. They were spared from the flood because of, basically, they, they, they're doing what God wanted them to do. And we know that after the flood, Moses, or Noah and his family, they come out onto dry land and God made a promise, right? God made a promise through a rainbow about that he would not destroy the world through a flood ever again. But I want us to look at what the Bible says about what Noah did and what God said in response in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth cold, or while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now you think about the magnitude of what God has said here. 
Two chapters ago, he said that he wanted that the world would be completely, or at least mankind would be wiped off the face of the earth because of his wickedness. But if it hadn't been for Noah and his family, right, that preserved humanity. Noah and his family are preserved. Everybody that exists today can trace their origins. Uh, if you had the records, could be able to trace their origins back to Noah and his family. And Noah, Noah's blessings to us is that we exist, right? We don't exist if, if Noah and his family are not righteous. They would have been destroyed like these other in the world would have been at, were, others in the world were at that time. And God promised Noah again, right? He's not, he was not going to destroy the world again through water. Noah and his family are preserved. We are here today because of what Noah did for God. But it isn't only but a couple chapters later where we read later on down the line, there's some people that have said, you know, we're not going to remember what Noah has done. We're not going to remember the gift that God gave to Noah for his obedience to him. Because they, like us, also could trace their lineage back to Noah. If Noah had not been righteous, these individuals in Genesis, Genesis chapter 11 don't exist. But we begin again looking at verses 1 and 2. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So we know what happens later on, their disobedience. Right, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it is important for us to at least first remember one of the things that God had given them, at least to, to their ancestors, was that God gave them favor because of Noah's obedience. They had that example to follow. That example was there for to think about and to remember. And that example was there to remind them that if God gave favor to an individual because of his obedience, that should be good enough for us. That's what my life goal should be is to strive to be as obedient to God as I possibly can. But we see that they, in a minute, that they don't, they take advantage of that provision, the grace that comes, the favor that comes from being obedient. They also took advantage of a universal language, right? We, and that's the point, verses 1 and 2, right? Everybody spoke the same language. They were of one speech. Now, you think about that for a moment, right? You think about how awesome it would be if the world spoke one language. It doesn't have to be English. Uh, it could have been the language that they were speaking at this time, but you know, think about how simple things would be if the entire world spoke one language. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I've always kind of wanted to travel to other countries uh, because you know, there are a lot of uh, scenery, uh, you know, things to, to look at. Uh, uh, I know the, uh, the cliffs in, in, in uh, Norway and Sweden and, and Denmark, places like that, uh, the, the northern European countries, some of those, uh, those high cliffs off the sea, they're, they're pretty uh, amazing to look at pictures of those. Uh, you know, historical things, going to see the pyramids or, you know, maybe going to Israel and seeing some of the uh, places, the, the same landmarks that you read about in the Bible that we've been talking about on Wednesday night. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to do those things, but one thing that's sort of held me back is that I don't really know the language that they speak. Now, obviously, you know, they, they, they have people that interpret and, and they translate some things into English and, and things like that. But, you know, I couldn't talk to someone who lived in Egypt, uh, an everyday person in Egypt, uh, because I don't know the language, because we all have different languages. And I, I think about how awesome it would be uh, to be able to know every single language. That way I could communicate. Uh, with, with people wherever, with, no matter what country I would go to and how awesome that would be. But it would be a lot easier to just say everybody spoke the same language, right? Think about all the, how easy it would be. Think about our economy, right? We trade with other nations. You think about, we all have the same language. Perhaps we all have the same currency. Uh, and we don't have to, you know, if, if we hypothetically go to another country, we don't have to, you know, exchange our currency for that other nation's currency. Uh, you know, it'd probably be a lot easier to get along. We all speak the same language in, in that sense. But see, we would, we would love that. But you keep in mind that they had this advantage right there for their taking, or they, they had it right there in front of them. They all spoke the same language. You think about our work as, a, as Christians. You think about the spread of the gospel, how much quicker the gospel could spread if there was only one language. And those that write... Uh, 
bulletins and, and try to translate the, the Bible into different languages. Think about how quick that process would be if everybody spoke one language. That's a great advantage. They had that advantage, but they took advantage of it, as we see in verses 1 and 2. This was a provision that they had, but as we're going to see, because of their own ambition, they at least thought to themselves that they'll realize this at the end, right? But they, they didn't recognize how sufficient having that one language was. So verse 3, this is where we see, again, the human ambition kicking in. Sometimes when we are ambitious, and, and when we talk about ambition here, we're talking about ambition apart from God's will. Sometimes when we are ambitious because of our own self-desire, we want to have more recognition in life. We want to have more personal recognition in life. Notice what is said there in verses 3 and 4. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. So their plan is to go and build a tower, but you know why there in verse 4. Whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. You see, in their minds, what it meant to have a great life, at least, it wasn't about obedience, right? That, that's not sufficient enough. You know, we've got one language, that's not sufficient enough. What we really needed to make it in life is to make sure that people know who we are. Let's go and build a tower, but when we build this tower, let's make sure that when it comes to who gets credit for this, people are going to remember our names for building it. People are going to remember our names for building it. You know, sometimes in life, we can have the same attitude. When we're not happy or when we're not content with what we have, sometimes we, 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 fight, we, we, we tell ourselves we're not content because we don't have enough recognition in life. So sometimes that results in people that you see that spend their entire life in work, and their whole goal is to keep moving up the, 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 the ladder in order to get a better job because... By the time they get to the end of their life, if they're the head of the company, everybody's going to know who they are. And that's what some people live for, to, to be recognized by other individuals uh, and to have their name to be remembered. You think about people that uh, you go to Hollywood, you think about the, uh, the walkway there where you see people's names there on the pavement. Uh, and, and some people would look at the names on that pavement and say, these people had uh, made it in life. They were successful in life because they've got a name right there with all the famous movie stars and actors that have ever lived. And for some people, that's what they live for, to have a name, to be recognized by other people. But that doesn't always bring about happiness. And we'll see, we know what happens, the scripture reading tells us, but we'll talk about it in a minute. This ambition for a greater name sort of backfires on them. We don't remember them for how great the tower was, but we remember them for how it fell. We remember them because of what happens in verses 8 and 9. Sometimes when we are looking for building a better name for ourselves, for our own self-desire, it doesn't work for us. Likewise, we know that ambition, human ambition, is not the permanent solution to insecurity. And that's the end of verse 4. Not only do we need to build this tower for our name, but at the same time, we build this tower because lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. And there's a sense again of worry, right? The, the sense of worry. It's not good enough for us to be obedient to God, right? God's command too at this time, we know this from Noah, but their, their, their command was is to spread about upon the earth, not to congregate in one area, but, but to continue to spread upon the earth. But they're not content with that. They're not happy with that. They're not happy with that command to be obedient. And as a result, their ambition to make a name for themselves, it, it reveals that they are insecure about where they're at. Right? We make a name for ourselves. We won't be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. If we're not scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, we're more likely to be able to protect ourselves. If we are, you know, if we are centrally located, we're going to have a better advantage of taking care of ourselves. But it doesn't matter if God told us to spread abroad upon the earth like he told Noah. It doesn't matter what God said because we can 
figure out how we can be secure in life. If we work hard enough, doesn't matter what God said, but if we work hard enough the way that we know how to do it, we can be secure in life, is the mindset that they have there. But the problem is, is that ambition, human ambition, does not lead to permanent security in life. Paul would talk about that in Philippians chapter 4, the peace that passes all understanding. That cannot be found in human wisdom. That cannot be found in and of ourselves. That is only found through obedience to Jesus because we cannot have security in life without having a relationship with God. As Matthew 6 indicates, he are uh, seeking first the kingdom of God, are seeking first the kingdom of God, as Jesus said there, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these, all the, the necessities in life that he talks about in chapter 6. Don't have to, you won't have to worry about that. But sometimes ambition in life can also lead to unhappiness. This is sort of an idea, the same idea as contentment. But the, I do want to point out, though, that when human ambition is properly channeled, it can work. Right? If human, human ambition can be acceptable if it is properly channeled. You know, David, for instance, right? We've been talking about David a lot. We'll talk about in, in, in the book of uh, 2 Samuel when you go into 1 Kings. David, at one point in his life, had the ambition, you know, God, I want to build you a permanent house. I want to build you a temple where the people will come and worship you. You don't have to worry about that tabernacle that's really only temporary it's moved around you will have a permanent dwelling place you know and even though God doesn't allow David to build the temple David had human ambition but he wanted to do it for the sake of God right he wanted to build the temple not for himself but to build it for God to do all those things for him likewise we think about that as well right within the church whenever we you know whenever we are a part of the church we're obviously expected to, to work to be a part of the work uh, and the work that we do you know there's nothing wrong with being ambitious with that right to, to try to do the most that we can uh, if we're doing it for the right reasons you know we think about Acts chapter 8 right Simon the sorcerer he wanted to do one part of the work of the church at least uh, and that was to impart miraculous gifts on others but Peter understood that Simon's ambition was not in line with what God wanted because Simon only used the power that Peter had. That, his desire was to use that to make more money. And Peter recognized that that ambition was not properly channeled. Uh, and likewise, Peter rebuked Simon for that. But when we think about our ambition within the church, we're not here to make a name for ourselves, but we're here to help serve others. As Jesus showed on multiple occasions to his disciples, their goal was uh, not to build a name for themselves as Christians, but to be able to serve others. Uh, and that's what we should be ambitious for if we channel it properly. But in this case, the people in, at the Tower of Babel, they're not ambitious for the purposes of God. They're only ambitious for themselves. Let's go ahead and read the rest of this text down through verse 9. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered thus abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And you think about the end result of it, right? They said they weren't happy, essentially verses 1 and 2 down through verse 4. They're not happy because they don't have this tower. They don't have a great name for themselves. They don't feel that their position in life is secure. So we're going to do everything in our power, apart from God, to make sure we are safe in this life. But think about how it just ended for them, right? God comes down, sees what they're trying to do, knows that they're doing this for their own pride, and God's result is that they're going to be punished for that. Because you see, human ambition led to more discontentment. It led to more unhappiness. The very things that they were worried about, that they did not think God had done enough for them, 
They lost all of that because of their own ambition. They were worried about, again, making a name for themselves. Well, again, why do we remember the people at the Tower of Babel? Is it because they built a great tower that we are able to witness and we are able to visit today like other historical landmarks? It's not the case. We don't know where the Tower of Babel is because it's not there. It's destroyed. We, met, we remember the people at the Tower of Babel because of their failure and not because of that tower that they built. That's what their name means to us today. It's, it's not a name of positive recognition. It's a name of, of failure. Likewise, you think about how ambition combined with discontentment and unhappiness. You, you Again, you think about how the end result here shows about the problems of worrying about their own security. They were terrified of being scattered abroad upon the earth. And that's why they wanted to have this central building in place where they could uh, look to it as sort of the center of their civilization. And what happens at the end of it? Verse 8 again, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. The thing that they worried about, the thing that they said that at that time, you know, God had not done enough for us, we can do better than what God has given us. Look at the end result of that. They were worried about being scattered off. Now, verse 8, the end result is they were disobedient to God. They are scattered abroad on the earth. And that shows to us, I think this draws this to a close about what happens when we fail to recognize that God, what God gives us is sufficient. And, and what happens when we fail to recognize the problems that our own ambition can lead to. Because as we, as we close, the Tower of Babel had lasting consequences. It had lasting consequences because you have divisions between Jews and Gentiles, right, that come later on. You see, we, we've been talking about in the book of 1 Samuel, right? The problems between those countries. There's a lot of bloodshed that is, that, that is uh, there's a lot of blood that is shed, right, in those battles, the people that died. You know, you think about in the New Testament, and you think about from the New Testament to our time, you think about the difficulties and the time that it takes to translate Bibles, to translate sermons and things of that nature. Think about how quicker that process would be if the earth was one language. But see... It's not because of what happened at the Tower of Babel. It had lasting consequences, not just for them, but it also continues for us. And it goes to help remind us, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, that man can achieve more through God's favor. And in that passage, Jesus was particularly clear about the value of man's soul. Verse 25, Jesus said, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The people there at the Tower of Babel thought that a name connected to that tower, security, by being so closely centered around that tower, was worth more than their own soul. And Jesus' point there is there's nothing that can value the amount of your... There, there's no amount, there's no price tag that can be placed on your soul because of the eternal rewards of being obedient to God. And that's what they didn't learn there at the Tower of Babel. They didn't learn about their own problems with rejecting what God had given them and their own problems with simply relying on their human ambition apart from God. This morning, though, we... We have to look at ourselves, right? If we have not been obedient to the gospel, we are just like those at the Tower of Babel. We are apart from God. And the Bible is very clear. We have to hear the word of God. We have to believe in Jesus. We have to repent of our sins. We have to confess Christ, and then we have to be baptized for the remission of sins to be obedient to God. And then, at times in life, I can stumble. I can fall away from God. I can go back and say, you know, the salvation that I had, the, the, the blessings that I have through the blood of Christ, having my sins forgiven, that's not good enough anymore. I need something more in life to make me feel good. And, and we can fall away from God through that. And, and fortunately, though, we can have prayers made for the forgiveness of sins and be restored back to the church if that's the position, where we're in, if the position that we are in. But this morning, if you have any need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?